Good evening. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, 39 years old and a Nobel Peace Prize winner, and the leader of the nonviolent civil rights movement in the United States was assassinated in Memphis tonight. A sniper's bullet cut down Dr. King in Memphis. In Memphis. Snipers, helicopters, and a massive police presence. You know of Yo Gotti's big brother, Big Joe. A new study finds Memphis is the most dangerous city in the country. This report comes as the Bluff City is on pace to surpass a record number of homicides. Decade of drugs, murder, and mayhem have all finally come to a conclusion. Forty Pettis associates have been prosecuted. The organization dismantled. Family members confirmed Joshua Taylor was found shot and killed at Orange Mound yesterday afternoon, leaving that community on edge as they worry who might be next. Memphis was the first large city African Americans moved to in large numbers. Actually, while the Civil War was still going on, and the infamous Orange Mound neighborhood had the second largest concentration of black people after Harlem in the 1970s. A multi-agency raid in Orange Mound leads officers to weapons, ammunition, and drugs. Today, though, unfortunately, Memphis is the most dangerous metro area in the country. Flashing lights, crime scene tape, and grieving families have become a common sight across Memphis. It's just rock bottom. Mm -hmm. It's just completely rock bottom. Fun fact, as dangerous as Memphis is now, its homicide rate is slightly lower than it was in the year 1928, which goes to show how little things have changed for some black Americans in the last hundred years. And for those of an older generation, Memphis might be most famous as the place where Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. lost his life back in 1968. But it really doesn't matter with me now, because I've been to the mountaintop. Bringing the civil rights era to a close and ushering in a new and more violent United States. A sniper's bullet cut down Dr. King as he stood on a hotel balcony in Memphis. So let's take a look at the Bovans and the Ronnie Woods family and the Townsends and some other people do an overview of the Memphis dope game up to and including Craig Petty's the biggest of all. Now, I was reminded slash learned about all this while researching Eric Bovan, the man whose funeral Yo Gotti and Big Jook attended the day Big Jook got rested in peace. And uh, Big Jook's real name is Anthony Mims, and the Mims family has been linked to the Bovans since the 80s. In fact, part of Yo Gotti's early marketing campaign has always had him referencing the fact that his aunt uh, was part of one of the city's most infamous crews back in the infamous 80s, Linda Faye Mims. Like, if you listen to some of my previous music, they're like, I know women really than dudes. And I always, you know, had these records where I talked about my mother being in the street, my brother being locked up. Like, so let's start with Joe Gatti and Big Jook's aunt. Here's a quote from a court document. Linda Faye Mims appeals the district court's judgment sensing, sentencing her to 84 months for guilty of conspiracy to possess Cocaine with intent to distribute on appeal, Mims argues the district court erred in failing to the, require the U.S. government to file for a motion of departure in admitting into evidence her incriminating statement. On appeal, she raises four issues. I'll just go into the first one. She contends that the district court should have required the U.S. to file a motion for departures, lower sentencing, pursuant to Section 5K1. So the family ties to the street Yo Gotti made a key part of his marketing plan was his 5K1 act. Interesting. If you didn't know what a 5K1 is, it's a motion that concerns getting a lesser sentence in federal court in exchange for becoming a state's witness after being a defendant, aka snitching. Eric Bovan himself cut a deal to turn on his own whole organization and some of the people he paid kind of paltry sums of money to to transport stuff back and forth from L.A. to Memphis. Some of them got more time than Eric Bovan, the ringleader. And here's some testimony from Anthony Bodan, Bovan, Eric's brother, about another brother who carried their father's last name, Salisbury. Prosecutor, 
after you became with Eric or during the time you were involved with Eric, was your brother Larry Salisbury also involved with DR Ruggs? Anthony Bovan, yes he was. And was he also involved with Eric? Yes. Did Eric ever discuss with you dope and quantities that were going to Larry Salisbury? I think he said a couple of times there were two or three going to him. Two or three what? Kilos. She was like our John Gotti, really, in our neighborhood. She supplied a lot of people in our apartment, so it was like she had their respect. Here's what federal prosecutors had to say in their synopsis of Lisa Faye Mims. Uh, Miss Mims' brother-in-law, Eric Bovan, was the apparent leader of a large coca distribution network that transported from L.A. to Memphis. After government officials learned that Mims' house on Monette Street in Memphis was being used in the network, they placed it under video surveillance. The videotape showed co-conspirators Eric and Janet Bovan, his wife, entering Mims' house on September 1st, 17th, 1987 with Earl Woods, a government informant. Woods testified he accompanied Eric and Janet to Mims' house uh, and they got twenty-five to $40,000 and counted the money, which was somewhere between $100,000 and $170,000. And then Anthony Bovan, again the brother, testified he would meet at Lisa Faye Mims' house picking up fifty, seventy-five, dollars dollars $100,000. Thousand dollars. There's more videotape evidence of people leaving her house with plastic bags containing a white powder substance. So Lisa Faye Mims seems like she just tried to tell after she found out the people higher up than her in the organization did tell. And the court later withdrew, allowed her to withdraw her plea, but she ended up getting 84 months. I'm not sure if she had that reduced. Now, a quick detour into a sad little tragedy that happened in Ohio involving the Bovan and Salisbury families. Eric Bovan's father, Herman Salisbury, had moved to Detroit at some point, late 70s or early 80s, and apparently was dating a woman uh, that worked somewhere between Dayton and Columbus, Ohio, a few hours south of the Motor City. One day, his girlfriend snapped and took his life while they were driving on the interstate. Bang. She ended up with a five-year prison term. Now, I don't know what Herman Salisbury was doing in Detroit, if he was in the game or not, but when Eric and his organization were indicted in 89, it came out that their first major purchase back in 86 was when they went to Detroit and bought two bricks for 46000 But they could still make a 10G or more profit on them in Memphis. But they soon found another guy, California Tony, and you guessed it, L.A., he dropped their price down to 19. And Eric Bovan, along with his brother, got on the stand against their former workers. So you can understand why Yo Gotti's aunt, Linda Faye Mims, tried to cut a deal herself. As for Eric Bovan, he actually made the national news in a front page article in the Washington Post about the U.S. Marshals auctioning dope dealers seized jewelry. Mr. Bovan's jewelry cited as an example of particularly worthless customized jewelry. He had a giant gold square uh, dotted with rubies and surrounded by diamonds and it said Las Vegas Eric in it and gemstones. He spent 100000 on the piece and the marshal sold it for pennies on the dollar. In 2009, Probably about 10 years after he got out of the federal prison for his 1980s activities, he got caught up with a crooked doctor doing prescription medication fraud. He would pay the doctor 45 bucks each to write prescriptions uh, and sell them on the streets of Memphis. Mr. Bovan had already had two strokes because of this time, according to his lawyer, because of his near daily habit. And when Eric Bovan R.I.P. last month, drawing Big Jook to his funeral where he lost his life. He was only 62. So when you look at these old photos and hear about the so-called golden days of the street life, well, really, a lot of these guys are like Eric Bovan. He had a kind of a sad life. His dad, unalive by his girlfriend in Ohio. Then he had about a four or five year run in the streets. Then he had his own family tell on him and he told on his own family. Then he started having strokes from his own uh, uh, habits and died at 62. And then his, his nephew-in-law got killed at his repast. That's the real street life. Drug abuse, early prison death.
for most people, though not all. Oh, what's that in family? It's your man, CRB Jr. Yeah, yeah, we just chopping it up and, and peace and love to all the people down there in Memphis. Hope you brothers down there sort out your problems. RIP to all the soldiers who done fell down there, whatever team they on. But yeah, we were smoking about back in the day. Uh, we working, you know, on this Motown Mafia part two. Made some friends where we always refer back to, uh, you know, uh, um, he's friends with a group of guys, James and Bill, the Bobos, which we have all respect and love for. They're based out of Memphis. They're Memphis legends. Well, by night, yeah, 92, Pops did time with this uh, cat, Muhammad, out of Pakistan. And Muhammad had some legal problems. They had a big, big bag stashed in Chicago. Pop went and got it. And then, you know, Pop got in front of some keys and he got back on his feet. And everything we wanted came to reality. And um, and that was heroin, though. Yeah, yeah. I, I, they, they, I mean, they got some real hustlers down there in Memphis. All the team we worked with down there, those guys would stand up, they always held their weight. During that Pakistani run when they helped move, a very large bag, when I'm talking about a bag, you know. Tens of millions. Yeah, yeah, the whole run, tens of millions. Um, but just good people down there in Memphis. So to the whole team down there, to show you how highly Pops thought of them, I think when he was, when he first got out and he was introducing me to the people in his world, they had to be either one or two on the list. I, these are some guys you gotta know, because these are, these are real guys. Oh, the Bobos at house in Detroit? Yeah, in oh. Palmer Woods and back. Right. Oh, so they were tied. It was, there's a big Memphis, uh, Detroit connection. Very big, very big, very big. Stand up, they were all kind of businesses. And so they're not just, yeah. And not just street legs, they had all kind of legitimate businesses and this, that, and the third. Plus they tied the pops in, I think, with a lot of other people down there in Memphis that helped. People like them all over the United States. You know, they helped a lot of people down in uh, Memphis. You understand? I'm talking about it's a lot of people know the Bobos down south. Yeah, we um, they hooked back up again with the old man in the nineties when he was yeah. in Pakistan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like I said, they, they was they was getting they, they was getting they was getting big money for years, and that Pippin was their thing. So there was this nexus of cases: uh, the Bovan case in '90, the Woods family in '91. Uh, this guy named Jim Townsend in 92, another guy out of Florida, Eric Antonio Parker in 91. One of America's biggest TV stars, Steve Harvey, also has a connection to Memph 10 to his wife Marjorie, whose last name before it was, whose last name before she took Steve Harvey's was Woods, and before that her last name was Townsend. Not to get into celebrity gossip, but it's interesting that uh, Marjorie Harvey's first husband, Jim Townsend, he got caught trying to buy 40 slabs. He got a life in the feds, though he, a few years ago, he came home after serving about damn near 30 years. He got out, he was able to get some of the time back. And then her next husband, Donnell Woods, who was the brother of infamous Kingpin Ronnie Woods, well, Ronnie Woods and his brothers were all doing her thing. She married him next, and that's who Lori Harvey's father probably is. And uh, Woods family are probably the most infamous street family in, in Memphis history. And they were big players in Memphis up until just a few years ago. And then in Atlanta, an Atlanta area DEA agent told my buddy Scott Bernstein over at GangsterReport.com that Yo Gotti's plug though I'm not sure when, was Ronnie Woods. Now, this could just mean Gotti was somebody seen interacting with them who seemed like he might have been a dealer, but, you know, he never got indicted or anything. Big Jook did get a 19-year prison term. Don't know what that's for. I think it was for drugs. Was it associated with the Woods? I don't know. Now, Ronnie Woods' brother Darnell is the one who married Marjorie Harvey and seems like he's probably the father of Lori Harvey and he used to headquarter his operations on a series of car washes and nightclubs some of which were in Marjorie's name. In the late 90s and early 2000s Ronnie Woods Martini Room in Hickory Hill was a rowdy hot spot popular amongst rappers, athletes, and D-boys. Perhaps this is where he met the Mims brothers Mario and Anthony aka Yo, Gotti and Big Junk. Now, Ronnie Woods got indicted back in 91 and went to federal prison with his brothers. 
Then in 04, he caught another case out of Houston. Then in 2013, he got another smaller case and he got out in 2015. And then in 2019, Ronnie Woods and his brothers got some more case, I think marijuana, ecstasy, cocaine. Uh, seems like the other brothers might have got out of this one, but Ronnie Woods, they're tired of him. Uh, his earliest out date is 2042. Right now, the Atlanta and Memphis area combined to form the biggest package and cargo shipping in area in the world. The FedEx hub is in Memphis with 34 million square feet. The UPS hub is in Atlanta with 13 million square feet and can accommodate a thousand semi trucks at once. And that's why that region, surprisingly, is one of the major drug hubs of the entire United States. It comes in from the border and it goes to those central locations to go out from there. And that's no wonder why infamous Memphian Craig Petty's was able for a time to be a part of the biggest distribution ring involving black dealers. They had to plug La Barbie, Edgar Villarreal out of Mexico. Uh, back in the late 90s and early 2000s. The U.S. attorney called the Craig Pettis gang a cancer to the community and hopes this guilty verdict will bring some closure to the victim's families. Now by 2000, less than five years after he snuck into the car lot and stole the stash, Craig Pettis was copping from operatives in Memphis. And Pettis was flipping uh, the product so fast that these, these guys in Memphis took him down to Corpus Christi, Texas to introduce him to their boss, Edgar Valdez Villarreal, AKA La Barbie, a Texas native whose high school football coach gave him that nickname because of his Ken doll-like appearance. He had uh, very fair skin, blonde hair, green eyes, he looked white, which was a, mer a rarity in Mexican cartel circles. So if you want to watch my full video on Craig Petty's, you'll see the whole story of him in La Barbie, but a few interesting updates. Craig Petty's, who got nine life terms, has had a hard time in prison, which started before he was even sentenced when he was in the uh, uh, Memphis Correctional Institute. I don't know what happened to these charges. At one point, he was charged with possessing weapons or firearms in the Correctional Institute. Kind of unclear what happened with that. Uh, he's moved around to a lot of different prisons. Big Meech famously accused him of being a rat. Some people say he is, some people say he isn't. I mean, the guy has nine life sentences. I don't know what he ratted on, but he may have done something during his time in the streets that somebody didn't like because I've seen different prison channels where guys say they were with him i think even that bg cellmate guy and you could take this all with a grain of salt he said that petty's kept keeps getting robbed by i guess other people from memphis including for like a hundred suboxone strips which are worth like four hundred dollars each in prison um is that true is it not he has moved to a lot of prisons um but goes to show oh well so edgar villarreal his supplier la barbie who got captured right around the same time as Petty's, maybe slightly after, um, yeah, slightly after in Mexico, and was kept in Mexico while he was tr he was trying to figure out how to tell and not come to the U.S. Came to the U.S. He got 45 years in prison, maybe back in Petty's was sentenced maybe in '09 or taken into custody. A Barbie probably got sentenced in 2016 to 45 years, which is a lot less than nine life terms. And La Barbie was in the federal system, Edgar Villarreal. Uh, you could find him until about maybe 18 months ago. He stopped being in the federal system, which means he's been put in some witness segregation. Is he? He's probably in a prison, but with other high level informants. Uh, I just interviewed Gene Borello, who was a mafia uh, turncoat. He said where he was at, and it was like the president of Guatemala, all kind of high level people that had informed the Barbies, probably somewhere like that, or he's out. Maybe, probably not. But 
Even when you start telling the feds aren't your friends, if you got something good to tell, they'll work with you, but you know, maybe Craig Petty's, I'm sure they drug that guy through so many interrogations. Did he try to tell? Did he try to give some info? Who knows? But he has nine life terms, and he's the biggest that we know about to come out of Memphis. And uh, the supplier to the streets of Memphis, the real one, Edgar Rella Real, is at least half free or free-ish. Sort of like the deal the Flores brothers made. And uh, to go all the way back to the Bovan family and the Big Jook and Yo Gotti situation, Big Jook and Yo Gotti, to some extent, were involved with somebody, even according to their own, you know, what they say. And according to the chatter in Memphis, you know, it wasn't, and it doesn't seem like PRE people are who got Jook. Somebody came from out of town. They say it was a message for Gotti. Well, what kind of message? Who knows? I, my, since everybody's throwing out theories, CMG presents itself as this big label, sort of like a QC or something. And, you know, they're successful. I remember Glorilla first came out. I was one of the first people I saw her song, F and F, and had barely any views. I said, that's going to be popular. I like ESTG. Of course, I love 42 Doug from Detroit. Uh, Moneybag Yo, he's about their biggest artist though, and he's partially Zach Randolph's artist. Everyone else is kind of like a region, they're, you know, they're big, they're not huge artists like QC had. The money that comes into CMG is not like the money that came into QC or other bigger labels. Who knows what those guys could have been doing to supplement, I, I don't know anything about this, but makes you wonder. Did, did, is, is, was, were they trying to prop up the CMG empire with some outside money? Because you can easily be owing four, five, six million dollars at a time to some cartel. And a record label is the perfect thing. Just like Jimmy Hinchman and others have done. You're moving around the country in groups to do different stuff, meeting different people. I don't know, it'll be interesting what the uh, investigation reveals. But yeah, Memphis, interesting place. A lot of Detroit ties. It's always been a rough city. Not as bad as Detroit though, but in the recent years it has. It's up there now with the Detroit's and Baltimore's and St. Louis's, which is not good. So uh, Detroit, Memphis, American Dope.